Okay, we should start today. Uh, this is our first and probably this year the only the only session that we have in English, oh, uh, due to the fact that our today's guest uh, comes originally from Canada, from the coldest place in Canada, Winnipeg. But he's uh, which which by the way is like the Shabbats of Canada. If I can throw that out. Okay. That's our internal joke. Okay. Uh, but he has been uh, for quite some time in Europe, and uh, now uh, he is like, uh, how, how do we say, Srpski Z. Uh, Shumadiski Z. Yeah. Shumadiski, yeah, to be more precise, yeah. So he's been active in, uh, in music industry, in the print and broadcast industry for over a quarter of a century. And from the early days of helping bands and friends while also writing for an indie music magazine in Canada, then to running a Polish label and distribution company in the 90s, to working in music and entertainment focused media in Central and Southern Europe with uh, different artists uh, and different companies, including uh, MTV, uh, uh, VH1, uh, Viva, MTV, uh, Adria, uh, where he was a CEO. Uh, now he's uh, uh, the owner of regional uh, music label called Lampshade Media, which focuses on artist development, uh, uh, brand aesthetics, intellectual property rights, uh, and together with, with his wife, Maria, who is here also. Uh, and she's also a, a Belgrade-based music uh, journalist. They also have a, a cooking show at Kitchen TV. And guests uh, at this uh, uh, TV show are usually uh, foreigners who live uh, in uh, Belgrade, or at least that was the first season. I must, mm -hmm. I must uh, admit that yeah. I haven't uh, watched afterwards. Uh, and uh, he also work, works with a lot of uh, music uh, groups, DJs, producers. Uh, in any way, he, he has a lot of experience in uh, music industry, and that was the reason why I thought it would be interesting to have him as a guest for our lecture, Is There a Justice in uh, Music, in Music Industry? Uh, and before I give floor to, to Daryl, I would just uh, uh, want in a couple of uh, sentences to, to justify the, the very topic of this uh, lecture. First of all, music uh, as a form of art is uh, obviously as any form of art, uh, very important in transmitting the message, different messages, including messages of social justice. Uh, if you go in the history of popular music, uh, you can see that the root uh, of basically the entire modern music is uh, usually uh, connected with, uh, uh, with blues music, which, which was originally music of black slaves. So the slaves who were uh, transported to, to American soil from Africa so blues originally was the music that was created as, a, as an outcry for justice. Uh, and up to today, we have uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, music genres and obviously uh, a number of, uh, of uh, great songs or albums which contributed uh, greatly to social, social justice. But I wanted also to tackle the problems of justice within the music industry itself, because there you can find different actors. Uh, we here are consumers of music, then there are music artists, then there are uh, big uh, companies, or it used to be that way that only big uh, music uh, uh, publishing uh, companies were one of the uh, actors. Now we have a lot of uh, independent small labels. This is also 
This has also something to do with the justice in uh, music industry. So there are a lot of interesting aspects, and I'm sure that uh, this talk will be uh, interesting to you, and I'm sure that we will hear uh, today uh, a lot of uh, uh, different uh, angles and uh, different approaches to, to this uh, interesting subject matter. Okay, so without further ado, I give floor to my friend, Daryl. So I, I just want to point out that it was only a few years ago that I found out that Professor's real name is Miodrag, because I've always known him as Professor when we first met, when I first came to Belgrade in the 90s, and lived briefly with a uh, band from uh, Shabbat's called Mishdal Logopepi, long before any of you were born, <laughs> whom Professor was also the lead singer of. So someone who is, is in the world of, of law justice and is also a musician himself. So uh, uh, when uh, Prof asked me to do this, it was, it was, I, I was trying to, I, I, I honestly don't want to bore you guys. I mean, there's a lot to talk about in the music industry because who is the justice for? Who is the justice against? Uh, you know, there, there are multiple, let's say, actors in this. And you know, I, I wrote down, you know, for example, it starts with the artists, it starts with the creators. Uh, uh, you've got management, like our, uh, um, someone who starts managing the artist, uh, uh, usually a brother or a cousin or someone like that, just as someone's like kind of kicking off. Then you have the record labels, which where we kind of sit, where we represent both the artist and the management. And in theory, our job is to collect as much revenue for the artist and help promote them as possible and protect their rights because that's what it all comes down is protecting the artist rights, which is where we come from. And then you have platforms like Spotify or Apple Music. What is their interest? What is their justice? What are they trying to get out of it? Are they protecting the artists or not? And that's always an interesting uh, question that we fall into. Um, uh, I've been associated with uh, Impala, and, uh, which is the independent music producers of Europe. We're the largest association of uh, music producers, associations across Europe. We represent over 6,000 entities, from record labels to large associations like uh, the German Independent Music Association. And from there, we created a, a daughter association called Runda, which is the regional association for uh, uh, music producers in ex mostly ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, and we're closely connected with, with Bulgaria and so on. So we're, we're very much about indie, which is where I've come from. Uh, I've had offers to go work for major record labels in the past, uh, but independent music and, and I guess basically protecting the rights of artists is something that I've always uh, found key uh, to what I do and what we do. And interestingly enough, um, Everyone thinks, tends to think about the major record labels. I know it's a little different here in Serbia. We've had piracy for like ever, uh, issues like that. Um, but here, you know, you have the Universals, the Sonys, and so on. But actually, over 25% of independent, uh, sorry, 25% of music revenue globally comes from independent record labels. And Serbia leads this as well. A majority of the artists that are released that release in Serbia are actually independent artists, as we can say. And we can see with platforms like iDJ, they're able to get, out, get the music out to uh, uh, fans all over the world. You may not be a fan of what's played there, but there are other opportunities and platforms. So uh, I, I always say it, it's, it's an interesting time to be involved in music because you could be uh, like a second generation Serbian kid living in northern Saskatchewan and uh, when Marcello drops a new album, you're able to listen to it the day that it's released instead of waiting for your uncle in Toronto to get a copy and then mail it to you. So in that way, it's kind of cool. Uh, like I said, I don't want to bore you guys. Um, you're welcome to jump in and ask any questions, but um, I, I always like to say I don't know much, but I, I know many, which means I know quite a few people in this industry. And instead of me talking to you from a presentation, what I thought is I would like gather some insights from friends in the music industry, uh, not just here, but globally, uh, who, who work in, especially the indie side, because that's what I do, uh, but who uh, have particular insights. 
Uh, I took this, uh, I'll say this, I've never been a lawyer. Probably if I was to take a real job, I would have studied law. Um, but I've, I've got a lot of uh, uh, lawyer-esque friends and I really support the profession. I mean, they've kept me out of jail in, in ex-Yugoslavia for at least 20 years, so you're good people. Uh, okay, that's me. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm referred to in the music industry as Drakce, uh, which comes from actually Atza, the bass player of Nishtal Logopeti, decided to uh, name me this, uh, give me this name at a particular music conference when I first, or sorry, music festival when I first came to Serbia. I proceeded to drink probably a little too much rakia, which was my first int introduction, and thus from then I was no longer Canadian, but I became blessed as Drakce. So, um, now again, I was referring to Impala. Uh, oh no. And again, sorry. I, I just want to point out I was in um, uh, Apple last week in London. And we had a. Oh. Yeah, you can help. So uh, last week uh, we had our Impala help? Why? So actually last week uh, we had our uh, board meeting for Impala in, in uh, London and we we're actually at Apple's uh, new headquarters uh, and we had a presentation from Apple Music and uh, uh, we were actually in the center heart of Apple. We, we cleared level of security that, that cannot be matched by anything uh, entering any country. And when Apple Music started their presentation, they couldn't get the audio working. So that happens in Apple. Sorry, give us a second. I think this is Google not appreciating being on an Apple uh, platform. Yeah, that's true. I guess what I can do. I don't want my wife to see the porn, so yeah. No, the, the, the link, again, Google is like... Well, I, I have... So, my editor is here. Yeah. But it goes to goes this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just try a sec. No. It is done. Nice today. Oh no, it's gonna it's gonna be a circle of death. Yeah. Here it opens. 
So I just, I just have to open for me. Okay. Apologies. <laughs> so again, um, Impala, Independent Music Producers of Europe, we focus on uh, the rights and justice of independent music artists and uh, uh, producers of independent music. Kees is the president of Impala. He's Dutch. He used to work for Universal, uh, uh, Universal Holland. And he is the director of the uh, Independent Music Association of Holland and our president of Impala. I asked him what he thought of like justice for the music industry. Uh, We actually have technology in the music industry. <laughs> You're just not connected here. It's not with us in this one. Shall we just go to the pub? <laughs> Drinks on me. Working yep. internationally in the music industry, and among my jobs is chairman and president of Impala, the music organization for trade indies. Uh, is there justice? Yes and no, that's always the case. The most important thing is that you, with every contract, have a good consultant who advises you and is helping you by looking at the right clauses. Full stop. But it shouldn't be your nephew, your neighbor, or a friend of a friend. It should be professional. So the entertainment industry, including music, is a specialist business. Hence, you have to really look for experts to help you in this field. I mean, I think what Kes is saying, uh, and, and this happens a lot in the music industry, when, when kids are starting off, they don't know much about the industry, what they're getting into. So... They get, they get some advice from, uh, as he said, a cousin or a brother or a sister. It's like, oh, I'll manage you, which is kind of the first level of uh, what I call in the music industry. Um, maybe people not necessarily going out of their way to screw you, but uh, once money starts appearing, everyone's trying to take their piece of the bit. I mean, apologies for my use of language, but you know, I always say, like, music industry porn industry. At least here you know who's fucking you. And that's the problem. There are too many middle people, middlemen, within the music industry trying to grab. And what Kays is, is saying, and he's been in the industry for over 50 years, find, and, and I think you're going to hear this as we go through some of the, the people that I've got speaking here, find people you can trust, but also find professionals that you can trust. And I think this is where you'll come in. Uh, uh, like I said, I've you know, I jokingly said, thanks to lawyers, I've kept myself out of jail in ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, but it's the lawyers who are able to communicate with other lawyers in terms of protecting your rights. And that's where it's important you know, from a justice side to have legal representation. All right. Now, uh, Helen, Helen is a... Yeah. Just a quick introduction, Helen Smith, she is the director of Impala. So she basically has managed our services and we're 24 years old as Impala. Uh, next year will be our 25th anniversary. Uh, Helen is the director of Impala uh, and as you'll see, uh, she studied law and she is very key. She, she's based in Brussels, so she does a lot of work for us in terms of communicating with the EU and so on. So. A shot. Hi, I'm Helen Smith. I work with Impala. I'm originally from Scotland, 
where I studied law and then moved to London and then to Brussels where I now work with the European organisation Impala that represents independent music companies and labels and artists across Europe. So when it comes to justice in the music sector, I think you have to look at it in three ways. You have to look at the micro level, so the question of contracts. Are they up to date? Do they include digital? Are packaging deductions fair? All of the elements in contracts, they need to be fair. The independent sector is really a leader in this area. Then you also have to think about the macro elements. So does competition law work properly? Is the copyright framework strong enough? Is the framework around artificial intelligence? Is that going to work in our favour or is it going to be something that causes problems for artists and creativity? We hope that the rules will be an advantage and we'll be able to explore new commercial exciting opportunities. And then we have to look at it on a collective level, an industry level. So what are we doing to promote justice in the music sector? I think if you look at Impala, you can see examples of this. So we have a streaming reform plan, we have a sustainability programme, because access to climate justice, access to clean energy, access to clean facilities to make your music in a way which has the least impact is also going to be a question of justice in the very near future. We also have a sustainability program and I think lastly it's also interesting to look at the international level. So we have another organisation called WIN and there for many years you have an initiative which is very relevant in terms of justice in the music sector and that's what's called the Fair Digital Deals Declaration and that's something which caused a, a major revolution in the music market by encouraging all music companies, small to big, to make significant changes in their contracts as regards to digital contracts. So there we go, I think that's a little resume of the different levels that we see justice in the music sector today. Enjoy your studies and hopefully see you in the music sector. Bye. So uh, actually just an aside, as Helen mentioned, uh, she would love to meet you. She, she very much agreed to it because obviously she was a law student herself. Uh, she's now been working in the music industry for 25 years, I believe. Uh, uh, she will be here in September. We're organizing our um, Runda Digital Days. Uh, which is focused on bringing the best talent from the region to meet with international uh, people. And uh, Helen has expressed an interest that if anyone wants to reach out to her, I can pass on her contacts. And she would love to see you in, uh, in September when we're here. And I haven't talked to Prof yet, but I'd like him to uh, moderate a panel for us on uh, the legality of the music industry. So that, that just, just to give you a heads up. Right. Back to our badly prepared. So, and, and again, you know, Hel Helen touched on a few uh, topics that are very big in the music industry right now. One of them being AI, which is big everywhere. I don't know how much you're getting into AI now. We'll have, we'll have a separate one of the separate lectures. Okay. Okay. So, so this is obviously an aspect that yep. is currently very, very uh, interesting. It's, it's having a, a drastic impact. I'll well, see the question, we'll get back to yes. Well, well, it, you know, here's the question of justice. Where is AI getting the inspiration to make that music? Obviously, you will input what you think, but when you all of a sudden say, I want something with a bit of Taylor Swift meets Prodigy, what happens to Taylor Swift and Prodigy? Why aren't they getting the rights for, why aren't they getting paid to, to produce this? And this is what 
the music industry is grappling with now. Uh, and, in, and in fact, uh, we had a, a seminar at our, at our last event, and we had a professor come in who's an AI expert, and he was, he was telling us, and, and I, I might have gotten this wrong, but AI improves itself by 100% every 40 hours when we talk about the music industry. And, and, and this was like three months ago, he showed us a program where you could hum a few, go, mm, and within a few minutes, AI will create an entire song for you, depending on the genre you wanted. Do you want pop, folk, whatever? And as it's, it's cool, uh, there's some great aspects to it. There's, um, I forget his name, there's a hip hop artist from LA who was writing, writing material uh, um, for West Coast rappers and he was involved in a bad car accident and it, and it destroyed his vocal cords. So he wasn't able to rap again. And he was kind of like one of Dr. Dre's best friends. But he, was, he had to step back from actually performing. He's releasing a new album using AI to recreate his voice as it sounded when he was younger. So there's good and, there's good and negative to this. And, this. and actually, this is where we're all trying to figure this out. And I know with AI, it's in, in, in all industries. Well, this is, this is where your generation is going to come in handy in, in the world of law uh, because we're all grappling with this and we're all trying to figure this out. Like, I'm, I'm an old dog. I'm, I'm in my 50s, uh, you know, trying to comprehend what AI is doing to our industry immediately is, is, is not easy. Uh, and we're trying to find a, a path forward. Uh, we, ha we hosted a company here in Belgrade at our, at our um, event and what they do is they, they work for the artists, the producers, and they search out to find out, is it AI or not? You know, this music that was, cr was created, did you actually use elements from an artist or inspired by? And then, then it's a good question about justice. Is inspiration, uh, is inspiration uh, um, part of the revenue? If you inspired something, is it worth something? Or is it, is it you know, I, I kind of like the sound of this, so I made it like this, AI did this, I don't owe you anything. And this is where we're all falling in right now. Where do the rights so? But, sorry if I can interrupt, but the music industry has always been like, long before AI, trying to find a way out of it. I, I always, uh, you know, you, um, uh, yeah, There was always a question about proprieting something in terms of putting samples of, of the already used song into new material. So there was always a question whether... With, without, and, and, and that's the thing, with, without requesting or getting it signed off. Yeah. Which, funny enough, uh, Apple Music has introduced uh, a, a new service for remixes, which no one else is doing. So if you have a DJ, DJ who does a remix, and, and that gets airtime, or that gets streamed, you know, who should be paid for it? A lot of times, uh, actually a lot of times the streaming platforms are like, well, that doesn't belong to you, and we don't recognize your stream, but we'll play the song. So Spotify is monetizing that song, but no one's getting paid. Apple's actually working on these remixes, and they're about to introduce it actually this week, where they will, mo they will monetize the original uh, mixes, the original songs, along with the DJs, which comes from a different, smaller, but everyone will be paid from that, which is why Apple's saying that they represent the world of indie and so on. 
student in the front. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if I was embracing uh, law, a student myself, I personally would focus on IP, intellectual property, because there's so, so much to it, good and bad, that the, we need to embrace. And as you said, I mean, the, the, sir, I'm, I'm familiar with Serbian, Serbian laws. It's kind of like, if you create something, you own it. But, you know, who can, who can benefit from that ownership? Is it just you? Is it someone else? Do you share in it? So a lot of questions there. Uh, a friend of mine, Sarah El Hamad, she's Croatian Jordan, based in London. <clears throat> so th this one will be a Nash. Uh, very interesting because she, she specifically is focused on IP and music industry, working in the gaming market. Because, you know, I, I always say, like, uh, the thing about the music industry, everybody needs music. Um, you know, you make a film, you need, music, you need music. It's not like you need music and you need the film industry. You might need to make a video and so on, but music is everywhere. And that's kind of what Sarah does. So let's do this. Bog svima, ja sam Sara Alhamad. Završila sam pravo u Zagrebu 2015. godine i danas radim u Letničkom uredu u Engleskoj, Wigan LLP. To je vodeći odjeznički ured za film primarno, ali i za video igrice. Moja uloga u Wiginu jesu glazbena prava. Obično radim sa raznim producentima, filmskim producentima, proizvođačima video igara, ali i mnogim drugim subjektima iz tech industrije koji na bilo koji način koriste glazbu u svom svakodnevnom poslovanju. Na pitanje da li ima pravda u glazbi, odgovorila bih da generalno mislim da nema pravde u svijetu. A kako je glazba dio svijeta, onda poslično nema ni pravde, ne nužno u glazbi. Ali ono što je mislim bitno tu je razlikovati pravo od pravde. Naš zadatak u odjetništvu nije da budemo fair, nego da slijedimo slovo zakona i da zaštitimo interese našeg klijenta u skladu sa zakonom. Tako da, ako bih davala um, savjet nekom, ono što bi prvo um, ja htjela osobno razumjeti uh, je njihov komercijalni cilj. I kada mi je taj komercijalni cilj kristalno jasan, onda oko toga izgraditi pravne mehanizme koji će omogućiti klijentu da brzo i efikasno dostigne taj cilj. Sada, da li je to pravedno prema drugoj strani, o to ne bih ulazila, ali bih naglasila da svakako bih očekivala da se sa druge strane opet nalazi odjednik. Ne bih voljela biti u situaciji gdje moram zastupati interese klijenta, na drugoj strani se nalazi osoba koja u pravu ne zna ništa. To bi bila jedna teška situacija primarno jer moram imati interese klijenta na umu, a opet moram i balansirati jer ne smijem ići predaleko i iskorištavati neznanje druge strane u klijentovu korist. A to je nešto što je klijentima obično dosta teško objasniti. I evo, utoliko bih rekla da u odjedničkoj profesiji Pravda je važna, ali svakako nije ono zbog čega smo mi tu. Kao odjednici smo tu primarno da zaštitimo interese klijenta. A onda kada naš klijent postigne uspjeh, bilo radi naših savjeta ili ne, 
kada oni postigne uspjeh, onda možda usmjeriti klijenta da taj uspjeh podijeli na bilo koji način. To je uvijek dobro došlo, ali kažem, to nije nužno naš zadatak kao uh, pravnih samotnika. You know, as you know, Sarah points out, <coughs> you know, there is a creative process, but it's, it's still commercial. You know, we're, we're, it, it's not like an artist will jump into this to make money, but they want to feed themselves as well. Uh, and this is where it kind of goes back to like finding the right people to, who, to protect your justice or to, to defend your justice. And that's why, you know, as she was saying, she works in, in IP, so supplying music for video, video games uh, on the music side. Uh, it's, it's having uh, the people that can protect, protect you, work with you, and also... You know, as she said, sometimes she, you, know, you almost feel guilty if you're in a, in a position and you're negotiating and someone doesn't have a lawyer. You, you almost don't want, you, you don't want to hurt them, uh, which is why the key is, and again, everyone comes back to here, find the right representation for your, uh, uh, for your art, let's say, not just music. Uh, any questions right now or move on? Shall we talk about AI again? That seemed popular. Okay, this is um, actually a, a good friend of mine, Fat Philly. Uh, I like to refer to him as the uh, godfather of hip-hop in ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, he, his, uh, his mother's from Jagodina, and his father's from the uh, Croatian seaside. So he's like a proper ex-U mutt, let's say. Uh, and he, he's been close to all the hip-hop scenes that have grown up. And we actually did a... Uh, a documentary with Red Bull and MTV a number of years ago about how uh, after the Yugoslav Wars, uh, if we can call it that, uh, you had scenes developing in, in Bosnia, Croatia, and Serbia. Hip-hop, but because there was no cross-border connection, uh, they were developing, but based on what they were taking from the U.S. And... Uh, over a number of years, they started communicating and realizing they were developing the scene at the, at the same, similar levels. And once they started communicating amongst themselves and then became part of a scene of the Balkans or Adria or XU or whatever you want it, now it's, it's really developing quite fast. And that's why I wanted kind of Fat Philly to kind of give his view. Plus, he's, he's heavily been uh, involved in the hip-hop scene for a number of years. And hip-hop artists... Black artists, soul artists have traditionally been screwed uh, quite a bit, as you know, we're going back to your comments about blues. Uh, so I, I wanted to give, you know, Fat Philly to give kind of his, his view and comments as well. Uh, I didn't ask him to do it in English, but he did it in English for me anyway, so yeah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. This is Fat Philly representing Zagreb, Blackout Hip Hop. Um, my friend, uh, my good friend, Papa D, a.k.a. Mr. Darryl Fidelak, um, asked me to do this in English for y'all. I've been doing hip-hop for more than 30 years in the Balkan region and worldwide, and I've seen some amazing things um, um, that, w that are still inspiring me to be a part of the music industry. Uh, is there justice in the music industry? Yes, there is justice, but there's also a lot of injustice. So it's a it's a double-edged sword. Um, you have to be a seeker for it. You, you have to be a fighter for it. You have to uh, kind of develop a sensibility for justice as well, because a lot of people don't know what justice is. And justice is different from me and you. So yes, there is... Um, justice in the music industry, you need to surround yourself with like-minded people, such as Mr. Daryl Fidela, and try to create your inner circle with people that you will be able to uh, share the wealth, enjoy the art. Music industry is two things, it's music and the industry. Music and the art is what inspires us, but the industry is what is getting us paid. So. Um, grow a tough skin, 
learn your ways, and seek for justice. All right? No justice, no peace. One love. Actually, I think that's pretty straightforward in terms of what uh, uh, Philly says. So um, we'll move on to... Uh, We'll move on to, um, this is a friend of ours, Ruth. Uh, she's Bulgarian, uh, but spent a number of years in, in the States. She is, she started as a musician. Uh, she has her own record label, and she now manages both a music festival and a music conference. And she's also a member of Impala. And she'll touch on something, what we call neighboring rights. Uh, which is important for us in the music industry. Neighboring rights are, you know, when you hear something on the radio, uh, that should be paid. Uh, and there's always been a struggle, you know, if, if my song gets played on, you know, Radio 202, I need to see my, my money for it. Uh, and this is where we have a number of collecting associations that represent the artists to make sure they get paid. I mean. There's always justice in getting paid. Um, but Ruth, um, Ruth, again, is very interesting because I, I wanted her to speak because she speaks both as an artist, actually, sorry, three, as an artist, as a label, and as someone who collects for other artists uh, in terms of, of justice. And you'll see, she, she, and I think because she is a true artist, you'll, you'll hear slightly, I don't want to say it brutal, but more honest opinion of, of justice. Hi, my name is Ruth Koleva. I, um, I'm originally from Bulgaria. I run a festival called uh, Sofia Life Festival and a music conference, uh, which also has a festival to itself called So Alive Music Conference in Sofia, Bulgaria. I'm also the president of the Bulgarian Indie Label Association called Amnit. I'm part of the executive board of Impala. And, um, I'm on the board of the Neighboring Rights Society for Music in Bulgaria called Profum. I've held uh, different positions in the music industry throughout my career. I've also been a musician myself for over, you know, I can fairly say almost 20 years. I've had a very great time being a musician. Um, and to answer the question, is there justice? in the music industry. Um, I, could, um, I could fairly say that there's not. Being part of the music industry, both the artist capacity and the professional capacity, um, there's, a, there's a very specific chain in how this industry is constructed. And in almost every occasion, there is no justice for the asset, the people who create the actual music. They're um, often the ones who are um, left at the bottom chain of royalties, of earning, of profit, and the ones who are uh, very much used. Uh, so it's very important to understand how this industry works. Um, Many things have changed throughout the last couple of decades, but the fact that the um, artist is, you know, one of the least um, profitable um, part of this chain has not really changed. Um, so it's a matter of education. It's a matter of uh, talking about this. It's a matter of trying to teach mostly the artist because their part is to create the music, to perform and to entertain people. But most artists, and I can tell you this for a fact, do not understand uh, nothing or almost nothing about the business aspect. They do not understand about royalties, copyright, neighboring rights, business, tax, and all that. And it is very essential 
to be able to protect them. So music can live and music can thrive. Especially now, when we live in times where artificial intelligence is creating music and soon, you know, holograms will be performing. Um, real life musicians and, and artists who, ha who have devoted their life to create this enjoyment for everyone else to, to enjoy and to, to have a good time should be put more up front and should be taken care of, should be educated, and they should come first. That's what I think is the solution. But my short answer to the question, is there justice in this industry, is no, there's not. But I believe that there's hope that there will be. I think she, she pointed out something, um, Ruth. Uh, it's protecting the artists. Because as she pointed out, the artists who create, in terms of the revenue, let's say you create a, a number one hit song uh, the artists, traditionally artist revenue is this much uh, and the song generates this much. It's so many other people collecting more money than the actual artists. And that's why I wanted Ruth to say something because she, she got into this as an artist and then she developed into management uh, and now she's, she's collecting for other artists and how important it is. You know, there, there's the, the uh, classic example. There was a, an American um, uh, soul band from uh, the states called TLC. And at one point, they were number one on billboard charts. They were the number one song in the US, in the world, and they were bankrupt at the same time because their management totally screwed them. So they were actually, they were losing money while they performed. And, and that's, and I think that's where Ruth is coming from. Like, you know, we need to protect the artists. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the, uh, here comes the justice and going back to AI. You know, the major record labels or streaming platforms are like, why do we need artists? We can, we can create all the hits, all the music, all the, all the material we need, all the content. We don't need artists anymore. AI will do it all for us. I mean, this will be a question that's going to uh, take effect in other industries. But that, again, becomes where's the justice for the artists? Yeah, I have to admit what was my kind of uh, personal motivation apart from the fact that the topic is interesting in itself. But uh, there are some, uh, so to say, parallels or analogies with, uh, with uh, in, uh, it's not, I mean, it is an industry, uh, an industry with the publishing industry uh, in, in, in the area of, uh, of academic uh, research and writing. Uh, you have a similar situation that, for instance, we spend uh, months in uh, writing an article, then we uh, spend months waiting for this article to be published, and then this article is published in the journal, which is, uh, well, which is very expensive, which is uh, uh, sold for, for a, a huge uh, sum of money, and those who provided the content of it Articles are usually not paid. Usually, usually you, you have to be satisfied enough if your article is published in some well-known journal. I'm speaking about mostly international uh, publishing rules, but that's the same with, uh, with our journals as well. Of course, there are some dissimilarities. We, we tend to write while we work, uh, and we are paid, we have a monthly salary, whereas music, musicians do not have, but on the other hand, they perform and they are paid for, per, 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 for performance. We do not have performance uh, uh, for which we are uh, usually paid, uh, but in, in that aspect of like creating something for the industry, which obviously uh, is becoming bigger and bigger with uh, enormous revenue, there is a really a similarity with, uh, with the music industry. And uh, uh, obviously, if you go to the history of music, how the things were, uh, were moved from one point where only big companies were there, uh, then uh, some bigger bands simply started to produce within their own labels. We are not in the position to do the same, but a similarity would be this so-called open access kind of uh, file you publish, you put for everyone to be uh, to be uh, available and open. And if 
somebody wants to donate, you will donate you know, something for her. So, so there are kind of similarities between the uh, two worlds, but uh, in both situations, the, the key, obviously, the key problem is how to find the, the justice, really the justice uh, between what is given and what is, uh, what is uh, received in return. This is where, you know, from the independent side, from Urunda here in, in, in the region and Impala, we're there to fight for those rights. And, and, and I think that's why our indie world has come together. Again, we represent over 25% of revenue globally. But if it's, you know, millions of artists who don't speak, uh, we have no voice. And by coming together through these associations, <laughs> on the na national level, the European level, the global level, we're able to have some influence on uh, the platforms that, that affect our day-to-day, -day, like the Spotify's, like the Apple's. Um, there are other platforms that we use, like aggregators, that get your music, you know, you, you give your music to these aggregators, and what they do is they get your music out to all platforms. Now there's a push that some of these aggregators are being purchased by some of the major record labels. Where's the justice for the independent world again? Because will they just be pushing their major label? Will they just be pushing Justin Bieber and, and uh, what about the smaller guys? So that's where we, we, again, going back to what myself, Maria, and what we do, it's always been about indie. It's always been about supporting the artists from, from the basic level. And I, I guess I'll leave it like this. Uh, we'll, continue on with conversations, but my uh, technically inept uh, presentation is almost over, but we'll, we'll leave it with uh, one of our artists from the label, uh, Marcello, who obviously has a particular view on a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's, it's a never-ending battle for justice, and you have to keep, keep on everything. You know, even, you know, we, we've learned, because we've been representing Marcello for a number of years. Uh, he does have his legal representation, but he also reads his own uh, contracts as well. So he, even though he's very focused on the art that he creates, be it music, be it writing, he still understands that he needs to understand what's going on. And I think that that's key to uh, the music industry and using the example of TLC, they didn't understand. They just put their faith in, you know, their management and the management, you know, we can't, you know, bless Marco. We can't just give him like, hey, here's, here's a contract or here's, here's a, a show we've, we've booked for you in Zagreb 
or Macedonia or whatever, you know, he'll actually go through the details. And, and, and uh, fair enough, he'll sometimes catch something that we might miss. So being an artist, justice also comes back to, to yourself. So that's kind of, uh, uh, like I said, I don't know much, but I, I know many. Uh, I wanted to make this a little bit interesting. Again, technically glitches aside for you to hear uh, different uh, people who work in the music industry at different levels. Uh, everyone who agreed to do this for me has said they're more than happy to communicate with you. I can share, you can go through LinkedIn or other contacts. Uh, they're more than happy, uh, you know, especially Helen and Sarah because they're, they're lawyers by trade. Uh, if you have any questions, um, they would happily get on a call or exchange by emails. Uh, and like I said, we'll, we'll be having our next uh, independent uh, conference uh, in September here in Belgrade. And pretty much everyone who's here will be attending as well. Uh, so they are <clears throat> more than happy to, to have you reach out to them if you have any more questions specifically about the music industry or on the legal side. And kind of what I wanted to, to leave it with is a question for, for you guys. Like, what do you think is justice as fans? You know, are you being charged too much for music? Would you pay more for music? Uh, do you believe, and this is something that we struggled with when we launched the record label, uh, most people here had this attitude that music was a free resource. You know, we could, we could get it for free off YouTube, or we could get it through torrents and so on. So, and at what point, where is the justice for the artists if everyone thinks music should be for free? So, just kind of throwing it up there, and if you have any questions... Um, Yes. So I do have a question. Is that the same one for you? What is justice for you in the music world? And what do you want in your experience as an in indie artist or more an unknown artist prepared to explain that justice for exposure? For me, you know, the, the, the reason I got, I got into the music industry was for, for my friends who were a lot of musicians. Uh, I've never had a desire to pick up an instrument, to be on stage, but a lot of my friends going back to high school were musicians, and I always wanted to make sure that they were taken care of. Uh, my first job in the music industry was doing royalty reports, where every time we would sell a, a cassette, these were these little things before you were born, uh, CDs, vinyl. <laughs> Uh, anytime we'd have a, a so-called unit sale, I'd be the one who would make sure that, okay, of that cassette, you get, you know, the, the PPD, the price per disc is, let's say, 12 units, 12 dollars, 12 euros, 12 whatever, that 20% uh, of that goes to the artist, so they get 2.1, 2.2 euros per. I'm the one who prepared the reports, we would do it quarterly, we'd make sure that the money was dispatched that we collected and so on. So for my justice, and, and I understand what you're saying, for me personally, um, you know, I've, I've had to, to go into other industries, like, you know, I, I keep talking about uh, independent music and so on, it's my passion, but I also was running MTV, and MTV is not independent, it's not indie, but it paid the bills, and it allowed me and my partners at the time to help, especially artists here in, in Serbia, uh, um, release their albums, uh, get videos on air, and help promote them and actually get paid. Uh, sorry, second part of the question? Um, in your experience as an uh, unknown artist or indie artist, are they prepared to explain justice for exposure? Because that's what I was wondering. Like, is that the same question for you? Is that the same question for you? So that's... You know, as, as Fat Philly, there's a bit of a double-edged sword there uh, because we always want to promote. Uh, it's, but then it's putting a value on the promotion. You know, when, when we launched Lampshade, we did a deal with Telenor where we had our bands um, played uh, uh, through Deezer, which was Telenor's uh, platform that they chose back then. Uh, they said, oh, well, well, we'll promote you 
and you'll get lots of exposure. We're like, well, what's the exposure they're going to get? And they said, well, you know, we'll, we'll put your music into the ads, into the commercials. We'll put posters in, in, in the, the shops and stuff. And we're like, that's all fine, but there's still a usage that you should pay for use of music. And, and we agreed to a lower rate, but just so that there's something to be paid. Uh, it's, it's something my, my dad told me years ago. He said, uh, whatever your, your, your business is, never give it away for free. You know, give it away for a fraction. It can be a penny, but always charge something for it. So uh, in terms of getting uh, exposure, uh, sometimes there are artists will say, I'll, I'll do anything just to get out there. Um, but now, I, it's usually with the understanding that there's revenue streams to come elsewhere. You know, am I going to get more hits on YouTube, for example? So we really try to avoid to do anything for free. Because as soon as you do something, you do one thing for free, then they'll come back and say, hey, that was a great commercial. Coca-Cola wants to do something. You're going to get the best exposure ever. You know, why don't you do it for free, but you're going to be in a Coke commercial. Coke can afford it, you know. You know, I mean, there's, there's a, a meme on, on the internet where, uh, you know, a, a bar owner says, like, oh, why don't you come by the restaurant? You can play today. There's, it's going to be great exposure for, for you. Uh, lots of people are going to see your band. I'm pretty sure it, you know, they'll come, they'll buy your shirts or whatever, but you got to play for free because we're giving you the, this platform. And then the response from the artist is like, you know, uh, why, don't, why don't you give us some free food and free beer and then we'll come and promote your venue with our music in exchange for all the beer and food that you give us. So, you know, if that answers your question. Always put a value on your service, whatever it is, even small. Because, and I, you know, I've, I've learned this in business, you know, when you establish zero as the threshold, it's so hard to get above zero. Zero just remains. There are actually a couple of questions there about the student thing. I have a million questions, but I'm going to ask two, I think. Um, the, the, other, the other million we can do over Rekia. Two million. <laughs> No, physical. Physical, you know. Yeah. No. So that, uh, how does that stand in Serbia compared, for example, uh, to the, let's say, Western countries? Because I probably, uh, most probably, the tours that earn you most money, and then second, well, at least my intuition could be. Uh, some streaming services, but also then if you're kind of rather popular, maybe I'm wrong, I'm just... No, no, it's it actually, a, a, a performance is where, is where the artist makes the, their, their most money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there's also something to call sync rights, but I'll get back to that. Uh, with, with performing, you know, you're, you're getting a, a, a big percentage of the ticket, as long as you have, you're getting a justifiable amount of that ticket. You have merch sales, and these are the kind of venues where you can sell CDs, vinyls, cassettes, or whatever. And you'll probably do more physical sales after a gig than you do on, you know, I, I have a good friend in Toronto, uh, uh, and uh, he says, like, you know, I, I, I offer my, my merch, my, my vinyls online. I sell, like, one or two every quarter, like, every three months. I do a gig. I'll, I'll sell like 30 vinyls and 20 t-shirts, and for me, that's a revenue in my pocket. So the, the, the gigs, and, and, and it's kind of changed, because in, in the 80s, and the early 90s, a band would go on tour to promote an album. Now it's changed. A band will release an album to promote a tour, and actually the tours are more value. You know, everyone's like, you know, capturing the moment and so on. So that's, that's where the money comes in. The advantage to our artists with streaming, and you know, I, I alluded to it earlier, like there's some you know, second generation Serbian kid in northern Saskatchewan who, you know, that kid 20 years earlier would have to wait till an uncle came from Belgrade or whatever to get you know, a, a vinyl or a cassette. Now they can immediately get on when, when Marcello releases, he's listening to it at the same time as everyone around the world. So streaming helps. Uh, are we getting paid our fair share? 
that's a whole different topic, and yeah, but but it, you know it all comes together. So yeah. So uh, let me just and the second thing is I want to answer the question. So like from the perspective of science, maybe it's a bit of a cheat <laughs> in the sense that like when I when you think about it, it's insanely cheap, and I have been quite a long time since I pilot music. Thank you. I don't I don't pilot it like since broadband in Yeah. Uh, I was piloting it in the times of Napster uh, with very, very slow connection speeds. So I kind of, I needed, it was work of labor. I needed like half a day to download three megabytes of time. Well, actually, it's not your labor. <laughs> Just yeah. patience. Yeah. Yeah, you, you needed a lot of patience to download. But, um, but nowadays, the majority of the music that I listen to is listened to one of the music streaming services, and the music streaming services is in Serbia, these are, I think, privileged prices uh, that you pay around five, six euros per month. Now, the sheer amount of music that you have available for five euros a month is insane, yep. that I can't even try to imagine that anybody um, for anybody, it's worthwhile to, to, to sell an entire music library for a month for six euros. So I don't see even if the, the streaming services gave all their profits to the artists. <laughs> it's still well, this is, this is like where almost the streaming services act as promotion. Yeah. And, and, you know, all the platforms have the back end for artists. So, you know, uh, uh, Spotify for artists. It, it able, enables you, it gives you the, uh, the, the, the data on where are, where are your artists listening to you from the most. So if I know like, shit, I'm really big in Kragovic, I'm gonna organize a show in Kragovic because of that. So that's, that's where if you embrace the, the, the streaming platforms and utilize the technology that they offer, there are ways to justify the, the low expense. So, uh, you know, like I said, I was an Apple last week and Apple Music mentioned when they introduced their uh, increased quality of, uh, of sound service, uh, what they decided to do was just immediately charge more. And you know, they went from five, six euros to 10 euros. And uh, they lost a few clients, but for the most part, everyone stuck around because they're like, well, actually, you don't, when you ask someone, do you want to pay more for this? Obviously, you're going to say, well, I'd rather not, but if you're really into music, you want a higher quality, uh, you are willing to pay for it. It's just, if you ask for it, like if you, if you have an option between like, okay, five euros, pretty good music, 10 euros, amazing experience, they're like, nah, I'll take the five euros for now. But Apple just decided, we're gonna increase the price for everybody, and very few people uh, complained, so. So one final is the indie artists. Uh, can you survive as an indie artist in Serbia? Because I always thought, no. You know, it's, it's difficult to survive as an indie artist anywhere. Uh, growing up in Canada, I knew a lot of musicians, pretty famous, but everyone had their second and third job. You know, it's, 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 it's still passion. Uh, it's, it's hard to jump into this industry and say, okay, I'm now gonna be a full-time artist. Uh, you gotta work hard. You, you gotta have the, you know, the right crew around you, as Fat Philly and others said. Uh, and you got to look for other opportunities. And I think, you know, Ruth, Ruth is a great example of that. She is a, I'd say, pretty famous pop artist in Bulgaria, but she has expanded her role in terms of getting, getting into the management side, getting into the label side, uh, representing other artists, collecting, uh, and also organizing conferences to actually teach other artists how they can monetize. So it, it's difficult everywhere. She's singing in English. You should check her. Yeah. She goes to like kind of popish uh, uh, R&B American style. It's, it's like that. Yeah. It's played from what I know. Yeah. But it's cool. Yeah. It's nice to hear you. Yeah. And, yeah. How many? How many of you or have you ever paid for a piece of <laughs> music? Yeah, is, is it, well, actually, actually, that's a question. Yeah, because well, I mean, there's 
But is, is, is anyone paying for a streaming platform now? How many do you pay for streaming services? Deezer, Tidal, yeah. Apple, Spotify. Actually... I mean, you know, YouTube has premium. Uh, they're looking at different models as well. And, and also, you know, there, there's, I wouldn't call it a war, but uh, YouTube, YouTube is kind of re-embracing its indie element, even though they're huge. It's Google and so on. Uh, but they've been very supportive of Impala. We do a, a 100 artists to watch, which is something that I was actively involved in. We, and we negotiated directly with YouTube where we put a hundred indie artists uh, on a on a list of YouTube, and then they what they do is they help promote it around the world for us. Uh, so I think you'll see changes coming with YouTube because they're, let's say, re refining their their punk attitude. Let's say, but but the ads, well, well, the whole idea is the ads drive you to premium. And and again, in the end, it's it's all about revenue. I, you know, uh, you know, wh whoever of my colleagues watches this online, I could be could be very wrong, but that's that could be how the, the music industry moved and quickly embraced streaming. Uh, and I understand gaming, um, as you said, there's still a physical element. You know, we occasionally buy uh, uh, discs for for our kids for their platforms. Um, it's just the the industry just I think went more for, for streaming as, as the option, you know, kind of giving you that a la carte. Uh, and, and also too, like, you know, uh, like our attitude, we, we have an older car, so we still have a CD player in our car, but I don't know how to play a CD anywhere else. So, not, you know, my iPad doesn't play a, a CD, so. Whereas the gaming uh, world is, is set on actual ports, so they've just kept it as part of the element. LPs are coming back big, and LPs represent. Uh, uh, there were there were some. Can't find it here, but there were, there were numbers uh, of uh, in terms of 2023 physical sales, and now LPs represent something like 80 percent of all physical, you know, above and beyond CD, some cassettes, and so on. But the the actual LPs are are causing physical sales to increase over the last couple of years. And, you know, we're having a hard time, you know, when we want to press an LP, uh, you know, for this market, 300, 500, you know, we can only do the minimum. We're having problems because we're getting bumped by the, the vinyl producers in Europe because, you know, Universal comes to them and says, all right, we've got, we've got a new Taylor Swift. We need to, you know, we need to do a run of 20,000 LP. So, yeah. In, in, invest, uh, invest in an LP pressing plant. I'm more interested in what, what do you other do? Oh, I'm not subscribed to any streaming services. Do you care about music at all?
Nobody downloads, I mean, you just don't store any music, you don't pirate the music in the sense when we pirated it, we naturally was downloading one song and that was yeah. it. So what do you do? You basically get it from the Spotify because you have the option to pay. Ah, you have Spotify free, okay. So, so yes, also they have, I know they have a contract with uh, IRC, for example, in one. You no. get well, no, but that's, but that's, yeah, that, that but that, that's, so the, 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 yeah. Well, it, it's not free because it is, it's, it's part of, it's part of your package. And, and we were, we were actually helping, um, working with Tidal when they were entering the market here in terms of communicating with some of the operators. They ended up going with United Group SBB. Uh, but Tidal was able to op uh, launch across the whole region. I know they're, they're moving back, but they launch across the whole region. By, and, and still a lot of people who have SBB didn't realize because they had the premium package, they had Tidal as well, which in theory was being paid for with their premium package. Well, the, you know, if you think about it, prior to uh, the streaming platforms, consumption of music was usually radio, and then you would listen on your own LP or cassette deck. So you would, you would, you would listen to what the radio station was playing. Obviously, you chose radio stations that you liked, but you didn't have full control of the content. And then when you had control, you would play uh, an LP or CD or cassette. And then the whole idea with streaming platforms is to give you the right to choose exactly what you want to listen to. And, and that's what's happening with the, the streaming platforms now. Spotify's invest heavily in uh, podcasting. So now you can set up your, your Spotify premium to play your favorite music. And then at you know, top of the hour, you'll get news from the Washington Post. And then you'll have uh, Rogan's rants for an hour and then you go back to your favorite music, you can get traffic reports. So it's basically going back to radio, but you have full control over what you want. And I think maybe that's the justice as a fan. I want to control exactly what I, what I hear. You know, I don't want to listen to a radio station because what if they play a, a shitty song? So now I, my justice is that I control exactly what I hear. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> I always love to, um for example, Mildred does these um, he mixes his music and he even publishes on so you should follow Mildred on Mixcloud. Uh, he does these good mixes and he usually prepares them for parties. You know, he uh, except when I ask him to do something for for an intro of a podcast, he doesn't want to do it because he's just a bad person. But yeah, this is um, and I actually enjoy it more, me not being somebody who likes to mix his own music, and I never liked owning physical music, because I was moving a lot. Yeah. Um, so I was always leaving, nobody, I mean, you don't bring 200 CDs with you when you travel somewhere for a scholarship. Uh, so I really enjoy the switch to streaming services, because we skipped completely the iTunes, which was a big thing on the West, we didn't have any of it. So when it switched to the streaming services, and it was done like six years ago, seven years ago, I think, I all, all, almost, when, when Deezer first came out, I was paying for Deezer via Telecom, then when, uh, when Spotify, yeah. no, it was Apple Music, so I settled for Apple Music, and I, and I listened 
to everything that Apple Music has, but what I actually enjoy on Apple Music is that they have humanly cur curated playlists. Yes. That's a feature for me, a top-notch feature. It's not always something that I like, but I really enjoy the fact that somebody put an alternative rock playlist for me, or for me, an alternative rock playlist uh, that I that I can listen to it. Because it's it's not really easy, even if you skip it. So, uh, and I think the DLPs are making a comeback because you can't skip easily. I will, the only thing that I'm missing is that I haven't listened to an album in ages. Yeah. Like an album, so you always skip. Uh, I guess you, don't, uh, you don't give anything a chance. You just skip in all the time, except in your car. And when you have an LP, you just play it entirely. And then you have the option to kind of like... Um, well, to, to sorry, uh, just to quickly jump in. Vinyls become like an auxiliary to your streaming experience. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we represent Beggar's Group across the region, and our biggest release last year was the new Queens of the Stone Age. And, be, you know, let's say, you know, they're more alternative rock, they have an older audience and so on, but we saw the, 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 the streaming pickup and then the push for vinyl sales. It really pushed the vinyl sales. So, like, like me as a fan, um, you know, we, we, we get the vinyl, you know, um, but we listen to it all the time on, on our streaming platforms, but we also have the vinyl, kind of like a proof, you know, like that picture you take from a gig, I was there, that selfie and so on. Now the vinyl is like, you know, proof of ownership. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm such a fan, I still, I, I, I bought the vinyl. And of course, I listen to Queens of the Stone Age all the time, but now I have the vinyl to, to kind of back it up. Well, give yourself yeah. a little big, big yeah. Maybe the last question, why is it not It's improving. I'd say it's improving. I, I mean, we went through this. When, when, um, when I was at MTV, Belgrade was kind of on the map of uh, bigger international bands coming through. Um, but let's say the, and I, I don't want to quote and get in trouble here, but let's say the venues like a Belgrade arena figured out it was more valuable to do sporting events and folk events. So it became harder to have a venue where you could have the artist play. Now what's really interesting is that the influx of Russians and to a smaller part Ukrainians to Belgrade, they're now booking shows specifically for the Russian market, for the Russians that live here, but it's not just ex-Soviet Union artists. Like there was a Kazakh uh, hip hop artist who played uh, Sunday at Hangar, for example, sold out 5,000 people. Uh, now uh, they're also organizing Ed Sheeran. Uh, uh, these Russian guys. We've actually become friends because they were organizing international concerts in in Russia, but obviously now it's difficult. Ed Sheeran's the Russians not... Russians organizing Ed Sheeran. Yes, they are. Yeah. So you yes. might send me as a Russian field. <laughs> <laughs> no immigration is good. Yeah. This is, this is that stage when, when, when it changed and so on. But, but also, too, you know, price, yes and no, but a lot, of, a lot of times 
agencies now look at ex Yugoslavia as one market. So if we're going to play, uh, it's just easier to play Zagreb and people will travel. Uh, we use the example, uh, uh, the band The Smile, which is um, York. No, 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 no. It's the Smile. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the guys from. from, from uh, yeah. So their first ever show was in Zagreb. Uh, uh, because they're fairly new, they were releasing an album, so all of us traveled to Zagreb to be there, and, and it's funny, in front of the stage, it was mostly people from, from Belgrade. So everyone traveled to Zagreb because it's not that difficult. Uh, as it turns out, we've got the Smile plane here in June yeah. at Tashmaidan, for example. But, but that's the thing, is, and I think you'll see that it's getting better, and the Russians are helping. With these two uh, messages, I I think that's what the minister of culture uh, asked me to yeah. say. No, it's all good. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, apologies for the technical thing, but what's a presentation without technical issues? Oh, and sorry, again, if you want to get in touch uh, with anybody that uh, you saw here, just maybe through a professor or whatever, let us know. They're very much happy, especially, especially the ones who are lawyers, because this is what, you know, they remember what it was like being a student, so.